And today I really want to talk about engagement and feedback in real time. So all of us know how to do this uh, if you have eye contact. Uh, but what happens if you lose eye contact? For me, this happened when my class grew from 30 to about 300. So I would argue that engagement drops, and so does learning. So let me show you a study which is fairly recently done by Rosalind Picard at MIT where she uh, monitored a group of MIT students with uh, those permanently attached wristbands. So for a couple of weeks, they couldn't take them off. In fact, she had each have two on each hand. And you have this electrodermal activity well correlated with brain activity with cognitive stress. So this is what it looks like for one day in the life of an MIT student. I chose day two, but all of them look the same. I have removed the time, but this is 24 hours. So now there is a quiz for you. Okay, are you paying attention? Are you engaged? <laughs> you are, good. So which time of the day it is when uh, there are different activities obviously going on here? When is work? When is sleep? Sleep is included, it's 24 hours. Uh, when is class? We're talking about classroom. Can you tell? I mean, they're actually with colored there. Okay, so, okay, I'll show you the answer. <laughs> and then, then we'll see what you thought. Because I can watch what, I can see what you're thinking, so. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Need I say more? Their brains are more active during sleep than during <laughs> my lectures. <laughs> uh, full disclosure, uh, this correlates with brain activity, cognitive stress, and it has been known for many years that during sleep, the brain is actually quite active for some of the time. It's slow wave and so on. So the huge activity during sleep is well known, but you still get the picture. Lab and homework and everything else is a lot more engaging than classroom time. <laughs> so, of course, that's MIT students. How are students are different? Indeed, they are. In fact, some of the students I know are a lot more active during class than uh, usual, uh, but not with class work. Uh, how about Facebook and Twitter with friends? <laughs> Online shopping? <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. So, my question and my challenge is, how do I turn class time into lab time? How do I, as we say, flip the classroom, make all lectures being kind of like lab time? It doesn't work for all disciplines. I would argue most of the time it doesn't work. You can't just flip the classroom for everything. Um, so what do you do then? Um, well, a couple of years I met these very talented software engineers and we thought, if the students have screens in front of them all the time, whether it's mobile device or a laptop, why not stake out some of the real estate on their screens and engage them through uh, their screens and at the same time use the real-time feedback to improve that engagement? In other words, be where the students are, be in their space, meet them where they are. Now, a lot of people would argue, yes, uh, going to where the students are is not the best thing, but when it comes to social networking, this is the culture now. In fact, as it happens exactly a year ago, this might have happened to a lot of you, uh, many of us were teaching on Boston Marathon Day. And notice that at some point, um, suddenly, the students were very uncomfortable in their seats. They had gotten tweets or texts from friends who were at the bombing site. I was talking, I was telling them a story, but I didn't know what was going on. So this is what I'm talking about. It is a world in which people are much more connected, and it is important to stake out times in which we are not connected and we pay attention but we have to offer something to our audience to get that back in return. And what we can offer to our audience is the ability uh, through their screens 
to have an archive, for example, to be engaged in the class through the modes of engagement which they used to. Now, the new generation is actually always lifting those modes of engagements. So, for example, one of the things you do, you create in your class a situation in which you manipulate a 3D object. Uh, I teach stars and planets, so that will be a planet. And maybe at some point uh, um, we can push the button and see uh, some of that uh, here shown on the screen. Um, so in that manipulation, I'm manipulating, they're manipulating, they have their own um, um, ability to change and understand what is going on and archive it. Keep it for when the time comes for exams and they have to study. They'll be able to go back and find all those things and mark them. Um, for me, that's important because I actually can do it, but also do it online. It doesn't, I have to port this to edX, for example. On the other hand, what is really valuable in this is that the engagement doesn't stop there. The engagement goes to a situation like the one we do every year in class, usually in March, we talk about Mars, going to Mars. Uh, um, what would it take? What are the conditions on the planet? How much do we know about those conditions? And as it happens, this year, a couple of companies announced that they're looking for volunteers <laughs> to engage uh, as the first human settlers on the red planet. And they got 200,000 volunteers sign up. They already down selected to 1,000. So I told my students, well, why I'm telling you about what we scientists know about Mars and how difficult or easy it is to do all of these activities and survive on the planet, why don't you think about these following questions and answer them in that engaging way in which we already um, have established in the classroom through the software. And then we'll talk about that. With a small group, that's easy to do. We do it in the old-fashioned way. But with a large group, you have to use the social networking of some sort. And it was fascinating. It turned out, as usually it is in a group of uh, people, um, especially young people, that about 1% of them do want to go. They want to be pioneers, and to them, this is really exciting opportunity if they could really make it into the list. And there are a lot of people who questioned that. And then there was a very interesting uh, uh, discussion that went on in, uh, in between them, and it was possible as opposed to chaos breaking out and 300 people talking at the same time. But, you know, what they really valued, I realized, is the fact that a lot of them could do this anonymously. They didn't have to raise their hand. They didn't have to say what they thought in front of everybody until they had thought about it more. And that gave a real quick reaction and valuable for me uh, um, reaction from the students to me to understand how they well do they understand what I was trying to tell them about Mars and how difficult it is to get there and what it is like to be there. And so while they were doing this and while I was telling them about Mars, I was also watching what was going on. And this is the value of it, the immediate feedback, the feedback in real time, which in the end is the ability of the lecturer or of the person who is standing and telling the story to understand in real time whether they really gone off in one direction or another and lost the people who are listening to them, or and do something about it. And you would say, well, isn't that asking too much, like giving a lecture and monitoring what is happening with uh, your audience? No, I would say it's not, because it's not difficult from the good old times of storytelling and looking your audience in the eyes. It's just a challenge which, if we manage to take, we'll learn as lecturers as much from our audience as they are supposed to learn from us. Thank you.